On Monday this week, Rachel received a phone call from her mom while we were getting supper ready in a bit of a hurried, crazy evening as we headed off to robotics at night for competitions. As she talked with her mom, I continued getting supper ready and I kept one ear turned, attuned to the conversation just to get the gist of what was going on. Hearing only one side of a phone conversation is always an adventure. You, you can make guesses of what's going on. You, you get to use your intuition and your knowledge of the people in the conversation. And you can make up your own little story of what's going on. I did not do that this time. I was more interested in figuring out what was happening. And Rachel was talking about dates and getting things on the calendar. And so I knew there were four possible things we were talking about. It could have been a discussion. We reminded her mom that Noah's birthday party was Friday. It's a big deal when your second child hits double digits. So we could have been that, or it could have been that we had a child care issue. We had to figure out how to rearrange schedules because Rachel's mom is our daycare provider when Rachel comes to work. It could have been planning Christmas parties. We have family from both sides out of town. It's a big deal when they all come in and we have to coordinate two different sides for that. Or it could be putting down dates for the big not family vacation in the summer. Rachel seemed kind of excited, so honestly, I assumed that's what it was because it's the highlight of the year for her and our kids. But it wasn't that, it was Christmas. The not family parties December 29. Aren't you glad you know that now? My mom watches our sermons every week on YouTube, so you should make note of that, mom. We can't do it on December 29 with the Browers because the knots claimed that day. This was my family announcement. This is how we communicate on the Brower side. It's a little gap, apparently. We should work on phone calls. When you listen like that, you never quite know what's going on. You have to guess. The same is true when, we're, when we read Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. We're only getting one half of this conversation. We don't know what's going on in the church in Philippi. We don't know what communication they've sent to Paul. We just know that Paul says these things, and then we kind of guess what's happening there. What might lead someone to say this to their congregation? Why would Paul say these sorts of things? And so we guess. Today we're going to do a little bit of guessing about what is going on in Philippi as we continue our study of the book of Philippians. Today we turn to chapter 2 and we begin at verse 1. Here are Paul's words, the words to the church in Philippi. Therefore, he writes, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion... Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we reflect together on your word today, we ask that you would speak, that you would give us wisdom and understanding by your spirit, that you would help us understand you and your call in our lives better. Father, we ask that you would speak, for we, your children, long to hear from you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. In the beginning of chapter 2, Paul is continuing his encouragement of the church in Philippi. We skipped the very end of chapter 1 where he says, As I'm standing firm in, in prison, you stand firm too. Be faithful even when you face persecution. And then he says, Therefore, which means given what I just said, said, how should you now live? What does this look like if you're living this kind of faithful way in your church in Philippi today? He says, Therefore, if you have any... And here our English language gets us tripped up in this text. Because we think the word if means maybe there's a question at stake. Maybe they don't have encouragement. Maybe they're not one in the Spirit. But Paul uses a particular word in Greek that gives you the answer. So when Paul says if, it's, he's implying how they should answer this potential question. Much like if I said to you, or to one of my kids per perhaps, you don't really want to throw that ball at mommy, do you? You know the answer, right? No, I do not want to throw that ball at mommy, right? Or if, if you were talking to an 18-year-old who was telling you how much they believed in Santa Claus and you said, you don't really believe in Santa, do you? They would know, even if they do believe in Santa, now is the time to lie, right? 
I do not believe in Santa. I don't want to be laughed at. Because you told them the answer. The word Paul uses in Greek tells the Philippians the answer to these if statements. And the answer is, of course, these statements are true. So the other way to read this text, if we wanted to translate it, sharing that information, we could say this. Paul says, therefore, since you have encouragement from being united with Christ, since you have comfort from his love, since you have common sharing in the spirit, since you have tenderness and compassion, do you get a sense that Paul wants these people in Philippi to understand that they're, they should be compassionate with one another, that they should have a sense of unity with one another, that something has happened because they're following Jesus? Why would he emphasize this so much? What might be going on that he's so concerned that they understand that they're one in Christ now, that they should have compassion for each other? We could make some guesses. We can be pretty sure there must be some sort of conflict in the church that maybe is causing division and tearing them apart, so Paul reminds them that they need to be one. Maybe he has, he has people following him into Philippi like they did in Galatia, telling the Galatians that they have to follow the Torah, all of it if they're going to be Christian. Maybe that conflict is attacking the church in Philippi and Paul is concerned for those divisions. Maybe. Maybe just like seems to be happening where he is in prison now, some are preaching the gospel in order to gain a position for themselves. Maybe some in Philippi, with Paul being gone, are preaching and they're trying to make a name for themselves and the church is being divided between those who like Paul and those who like these other people, like happened in Corinth. Or maybe Paul gives us the answer later in the letter. Later in Philippians 4 verse 2, Paul writes this, he says, I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind of the Lord. And then he encourages the church to help these two sisters be reconciled with each other. Because it seems like there's some sort of conflict between these two women who are leaders in the church that is now dividing the church. And so Paul urges them to find unity with one another. Maybe that's what's going on. Whatever the case, Paul is concerned that his beloved congregation, these people he loves, are being torn apart by conflicts, by grasping for power. And so he urges them to look to the example of Christ as we continue in verse 5, that they should have the same kind of mind and attitude of Christ. We pick up the argument again at verse 5, and Paul begins to break into song. I'm not going to be in the choir in December, so I won't break into song today in part because we don't know what the tune would be, but he quotes a song that the church in Philippi must have sang that they knew. As a complete side note, think about what this means. Paul wrote this letter at the latest from Rome in 61 AD. As I argued a couple weeks ago, I think it might have been in Ephesus in 53 AD. If that's the case, Paul's writing to a church in Philippi, and he's quoting a song they sing, which means it was written before 53 AD, because both of them know it, right? He's probably not quoting one of those brand new contemporary songs. It's one they've sung a while. It's their heart song, right? So it might be... They don't have really old songs. It might be 10 years old, right? Because that's an old song in the early church. So maybe it was written, this song was written in the early 40s. Maybe as late as the late 40s. But they sing this song about Jesus and how he was with God and was, was God, but he set aside that glory in order to come down on earth. And now he's been raised. He's seated at God's right hand and has all authority in heaven and on earth. And everyone's going to worship him. That's what we're coming, going to read in just a minute. Which means, by the, somewhere in the 40s, the church was singing songs saying Jesus was God and that he reigned over all and was in heaven. Now, in about four months, it's going to get close to Easter, and CNN and someone else will probably have a whole week-long expose on how the early church didn't believe Jesus was God. It was, you know, 150 years later, they made up the myth of Jesus being God. But... In 53 AD, Paul's quoting a song from sometime before 53 AD that proclaims Jesus as God. Within 15 years of Jesus' death and resurrection, the church wrote music proclaiming that Jesus was divine and was seated at the right hand of God. That's cool. If you ever wonder, can I believe this is true? Within 15 years, they were writing songs about it. And everyone knew it in the church. It's not new theology. It was the very beginning of the church that Jesus was the Son of God and was seated at the right hand of God. We don't have to have any doubt that that's what Paul preached, that's what the church believed. Even before the Gospels are written in 70 AD, this song was written about Jesus. So this is what Paul says. 
in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And here comes the song. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We could just end right there, couldn't we? What else does anyone need to say? But pastors have to preach a certain amount of time. So be ready. So from the very beginning of time, really from the first sin until the last sin happens, humans have been grasping to become more like God. To become like God, already made in the image of God, already given all authority over the creation to name the animals and supervise them and tend for the garden, Adam and Eve are not content in their place. The serpent comes and says, Eve, that, that fruit, it's actually good. If you eat it, you'll be like God. What was that first temptation? It wasn't to have yummy fruit. It was to be like God, not content in their place, wanting to be more than God made them to be. Adam and Eve grab the fruit and they eat. In the ancient world, Many leaders tried to proclaim themselves to be a God. That was what they aspired to, to be called God. And so the Jews would have been horrified and were horrified when Alexander the Great conquered the known world. At age 20, he became king of Macedonia. He promptly conquered Greece, Turkey, Palestine, Israel area, northern Africa, all the way across the Middle East, through Persia, into India, and then he died at age 33. You think you haven't accomplished much in life. He conquered most of the known world in 14 years. And then he died. And in the Middle East, everyone assumed he must be a son of the gods. Only a son of the gods could conquer everything like Alexander the Great did. A few hundred years later, the Roman Empire was being torn apart by civil war and people wondered if anything could hold it together. And then Caesar Augustus, came to power, and he united the empire. He brought the peace of Rome, the Pax Romana, to all of the known world at that time, and everyone, it seemed, proclaimed him to be divine. The Jews understood that people around them longed to be divine. They understood that temptation as well. In our culture, we don't often proclaim political or business or military leaders to be sons of the gods. Although with the cult of Apple, you do wonder if some people think Steve Jobs might have been a little bit divine with his tenacity and his obsession with design and perfection. Some people seem to think that. But we watch shows like House of Cards. We watch Francis climb to power on Netflix. He connives and deceives his way into the highest office of the land. And the story resonates with us because we all know people who seem willing to do anything to get ahead. They do not care who they hurt. They do not care the institutions they damage. As long as they get theirs and they get the glory, they're okay with that. And if we're honest, when we're all alone and no one else can hear us admit it, we're a little bit like that too, aren't we? We aren't Francis, we're not willing to lie and steal and cheat our way to become president, but we're all willing to compromise a little, aren't we? To gain a little more credit, a little more glory, a little more honor for ourselves. We understand this temptation of Adam and Eve in the garden to want to be more than we are, to want to be more than God made us to be to rise above our beginnings. It's the American story, isn't it? We pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, we become more than we used to be, at its heart, there's a desire within us to not only rise up and become more, but to rise up and touch the face of God, not as his servants, but as his equal. This was the temptation in the garden. This is the temptation we all face. And Paul says, rather than having that kind of mind, the mind of Adam, have the mind of Christ. Live like he did. Think like he did. Develop his attitude in your life. So if we're to have the mind of Christ, what should that look like? And then Paul gives us this wonderful hymn. 
He says that for Jesus, he didn't use his position for his advantage, or as the older versions of the of Philippians say, he didn't, he didn't grasp equality with God. He let go of equality with God. He set it aside, the glory of heaven, to become a helpless baby. Can you imagine how our world would respond if Christians became known as the ones who set aside glory and take the lower position over and over again? What would that be like if that's what we were defined as? If when we met someone, rather than wanting to impress them, we actually wanted to know them. And so we didn't have to talk about our great accomplishments and what we knew and what we had done. We just want to know what they were like and love them as they were and not worry about what they thought of us. What would that be like? Or what would it be like if when we were successful in life, we didn't feel any need to show it? And so we didn't have to have the big house and the fancy cars and the nice clothes because those things didn't matter to us. There was a day when that was true in our culture, when people didn't show off their wealth, and now I think we delight in glory in having the biggest house we can and the nicest car and the fanciest clothes and send our kids to the best private school we can. There's an honor in that that we long for. What would it be like if Christians were known not as those who show off their success and wealth, but as those who give it away, who set it aside to be something else. Because Jesus doesn't simply humble himself, set aside the glory of heaven. He does it for a reason. He sets aside the glory of heaven so that he can serve. He sets aside the glory of heaven, and then he comes and he lives as a servant. Jesus was the one with all authority in heaven and earth at the right hand of God, ruling over everything. He sets it aside and becomes a baby who can't do anything. And as he grows up, he spends his life serving others. He heals the sick. He feeds hungry people. He gives sight to the blind. He helps the, the lame to walk. He gives words to the mute. The deaf can hear. He not only sets aside glory, he chooses a life of service. When he's exhausted and worn out and in grief because his cousin John has been killed, the crowds come and Jesus says, I'll deal with my grief later, and he serves. When his disciples don't get it, and his disciples never get it, do they? He tells them things and then they totally ignore it. He says that his way is the way of peace, but when people reject him, they ask if they can call down fire to kill them. You wonder, do they ever listen to what Jesus says? And yet Jesus continues to walk with them and encourage them and equip them and cheer them on as they take very small steps of devotion and faith with him. He knows where he's headed and they're still dreaming of glory, but he's patient and he serves and helps them along. What if we went one step further like Jesus and rather than just not seeking glory, we set it aside so that we could serve other people? So that our lives can be defined not by our accomplishments, but by our service of others. One of my favorite Christian authors is Henry Nouwen. He was a Catholic priest. He, he died several years ago now. He was a, a theologian of first rate. He taught at Notre Dame. Eventually, he taught at Harvard. He was at the pinnacle of any academic career. You don't get higher in the United States than teaching at Harvard. Right? He has all of the glory that an academic who teaches religion can get. Now, there's not that much for people who teach religion, but he got all of it, right? He's at the top. And when he's 54 years old, when he should be resting on his glory and going on speaking tours and writing books and people talk about how great he is, he set aside his job at Harvard and he moved to Ontario, Canada, to La Arche. It's a home for severely disabled and mentally impaired adults. And for the last 10 years of his life, before he died at a young age, he spent his days serving as the pastor of these severely mentally disabled men. He spoon-fed them. He helped wipe adult bottoms. And he served. What would it be like if we were known as the people who set aside positions of glory so we could humbly serve and not have anyone know about it? What would it be like? What would people say about Christians if that's what we were known for? I wonder what it would look like for us to stop chasing glory and start chasing the mission of God. 
Jesus sets aside glory. He comes to serve. And then he obeys God even when it's hard. One of the most powerful images we have of Jesus is on the night he's betrayed, he goes to the Mount of Olives. He tells his disciples to pray for him. He goes off to pray by himself. His disciples fall asleep. And then we're told that Jesus sweat drops of blood. We like to think that that is figurative language. But what scientists tell is, us is if, if you're under enough stress, the capillaries un, under your skin can start to break. And then the blood kind of seeps out and then it oozes out with your sweat from your pores. And if you're under enough stress, you can sweat drops of blood. Have you ever known anyone to do that? I've known people under a lot of stress. I've never heard of anybody doing that. Can you imagine the agony Jesus was in emotionally in the garden the night he was betrayed that he sweat drops of blood? And what was his prayer to God that night? John gives us these wonderful prayers, but some of the other ones give us a very simple prayer. God, don't make me do this, was his prayer. If there's any other way, don't make me go to the cross. Do you think Jesus wanted to die on the cross? He was terrified. He did not want to go. He wanted out. If there was any other possible way, he did not want to have to go. And God the Father said, this is the only way, and he went. He obeyed even when he did not want to, even when he was scared and under so much stress, he'd, he sweat drops of blood. And he died on the cross trusting that if he obeyed, God would somehow redeem him, that God would bring him back. With no assurance, Jesus couldn't make himself come back. He had to trust that the Father would raise him up again. And he couldn't know. He had to trust. Jesus obeyed even when it was hard and frightening and agonizing. If we're to live like Jesus, well then we're going to set aside glory, we're going to serve other people, and we're going to obey even when it's costly, even when it's terrifying. It means we'd give to the church and to missionaries and to poor people, even if it meant we literally gave them our last shirt off our back. Because that's the kind of thing Jesus would have done. If we're going to be like Jesus, it means that we tell people about Jesus even when it meant risking our friendships and our job and our home and our freedom and even our lives because, well, Jesus gave up his life, so we should be doing that too, right? We would obey even when God's commands seem backwards and make us look judgmental and naive and ignorant and mean. We would obey no matter what it cost us because we'd be being like Jesus. Wouldn't you think this kind of life would end conflict in the church? If we were people who were completely sold out on not seeking glory, on serving other people and obeying whatever God commanded, it would mean we, would, we wouldn't fight anymore, ever, would we? Because the things people fight about don't matter to God. We'd be focused on his mission and all those other conflicts would go away. And if Paul stopped quoting this hymn where Jesus died on the cross, we could assume that's what Paul meant, right? Because in theory, we could try to do all those things Jesus did. You could try to set aside glory. You could try to serve other people and you can try to obey God. But Paul keeps talking and then Paul talks about stuff that will never happen to you or me. We will get raised on the last day, but we won't be raised into the same position that Jesus is raised to, will we? Jesus is raised to the right hand of God. You're not going to sit there, are you? That's Jesus' spot. Jesus is given all authority in heaven and on earth. You're not going to get that. That's Jesus' authority, not yours. Jesus has everyone in heaven and on earth and under the earth bow their knee and worship him. It's an observation. No one's going to bow their knee to you. You're the one bowing your knee to Jesus in that image, right? This is about Jesus, not about you. And if this hymn is about Jesus, not about us, we run a dangerous road when we make it about us. Because suddenly now this becomes our checklist of the things we need to do so that God will have to love us. It becomes the work that we do. And so rather than seeking honor in our high status in church, we'll start seeking honor in our low status. Well, I could have been on consistory. They asked me, but I said no. And instead, I pick up the dishes after the Wednesday night meal and I never ask anyone to thank me because I don't want any credit, right? And suddenly it's all about our honor for the ways we humble ourselves. Or rather than grasping for leadership and power, we'll talk about, well, I could have gone to seminary and been a minister. 
I could have been a commissioned pastor like Pastor Rick. I could have done that, but instead, I teach children in worship. I teach the little kids because I just, I don't want to... I just want to serve the littlest in the church. I don't want any attention for me. And now our service is really about us, isn't it? Rather than about Jesus. Or rather than coming to God in repentance, recognizing our sin, we'll come to God with our list of all the ways we've humbled ourselves and served other people and obeyed God. And we'll be like the Pharisee telling God, thank you, I'm not like that sinner publican over there. If this becomes our to-do list of how we can be like Jesus. And we find ourselves worse off than we were before because now we're the arrogant, self-righteous jerks. And who wants to be in a place like that? There'll be more conflict in the church rather than less. So what might Paul's point be in this great hymn? Rather than laying out a blueprint for how we should live good moral lives, I think Paul is urging the Philippians and us to center our lives on the worship of Jesus. When we become enthralled with Christ, when when he becomes all we think about during the week, when he becomes the one true love of our lives, we will naturally begin to see our place as image bearers of God. Not grasping that high status, we'll delight in the one who has that position and the love he's shown for us because it's about him, not about us. We'll naturally serve others because we'll want to love them because Jesus loves them and we love Jesus. And when you love someone, you love the people that they love. And so we'll start doing those things, not because we have to, but because it's who God made us to be because we worshiped his son and it changes us. We'll trust Jesus even when his commands are scary because we will have seen his love revealed on the cross and that will be the defining moment of our lives. That's why we gather for worship each week, isn't it? We don't gather for worship because the sermons are scintillating. We don't gather for worship because the praise man is awesome. We gather for worship because we know we need to center our lives again around the one who died for us. And when we do that, we begin to shape our attitude to become more like his. Not because we try to, but because we think on him. And when we think on Jesus, his spirit begins to reshape how we think. So this is my prayer for you today, that you would be consumed, that your life would be lit on fire by the glory and majesty of the one who died for you and lives that you too might live. Believe this gospel and live in its peace. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today that Jesus set aside his glory, that he humbled himself and that he obeyed so that we who were dead could be made alive so that we who were trapped in sin could be set free, so that we who were grasping for power could see the love of the one who had all the power and be changed by it. Help us today to be changed by your Son, to be led by his Spirit, that we might reflect all the glory back to you. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen.